Hey team, Ben here from Built to Fish TV and welcome to this Daiwa Angler Talk presented by Daiwa New Zealand. Now over the last week or so, Daiwa asked you guys to submit some questions around southern bluefin tuna fishing. We've had a really great response and hopefully today I can answer some of those questions for you guys and hopefully it will result in you guys catching more tuna. The southern bluefin tuna fishery in New Zealand has really exploded in popularity in the last few years. It's only really been a recreational fishery for five or six years. Our mates over in the commercial longline fleet started sharing a little bit of information. They let us know that those migratory bluefin tuna actually come a little closer to the coast than we previously thought. And it's really opened up an amazing winter game fishery that we're really excited about. Now before I get into this video, Bluefin tuna fishing is exactly the same as all other types of fishing. There's more than one way to do it right. Everyone has different gear they like to use, different techniques they like to employ. They've all got their favorite lures and none of them are right or wrong. All I can talk to is the things I've done that have helped me to have some success and hopefully I can share them with you and they'll help you have some success. Now, one of the first questions everyone asks is what is the optimum trolling speed for bluefin tuna. When I'm marlin fishing, I have a very specific RPM range. On my boat, which is a 750 Surtees game fisher, I've got a 250 horsepower four, strip, four stroke Honda and I troll at 2,250 RPM. On a calm day with no current, that results in a boat speed of about 6.7 to 7.3 knots. Obviously, if I turn into a current or go down current or turn into a sea or go down sea, my boat speed's going to change. But if I look back at my lures, they're still working and I know that at that RPM, I've got good harmonics, my lures work well, I raise marlin and I ultimately catch marlin. When I'm bluefin tuna fishing, I try and troll faster, I haven't got the same experience and I haven't got the same confidence in my systems because I haven't caught as many bluefin tuna. So I pay a lot more attention to what my actual boat speed is and I try and keep it somewhere between 7.5 and 8.5 knots. So I guess a knot or so faster than what I'd trawl for striped marlin at. The unfortunate trade-off is you're going to burn more fuel at that higher RPM rating but it's a necessary evil and we all know as game fishermen it's not a good way to save money. The next question I get a lot is how far do I run my lures back? particularly when I'm comparing it to trailer boat fishing for marlin. Again, there's a pretty general rule of thumb which is you run your lures further back. When I'm marlin fishing, I run a very standard staggered lure system. I have a short corner, I then have a long corner which is a wake or two back. I'm running my short corner about three wakes back behind my dredge. On the fourth wake I'll run a long corner. On the fifth wake I'll run a short rigger. On the sixth wake I'll run a long rigger and then I'll run a shotgun all the way back. When I'm setting up my tuna spread, I run everything three or four wakes back, quite a lot further back than I would for marlin. And I also, instead of staggering them, I have them parallel to each other, creating a very symmetrical spread. When you're marlin fishing and you have your lures parallel to each other, you run the risk of a marlin coming outside into your spread, biting a lure and then immediately jumping across the line of the lure right next to you. Tuna don't jump when they bite, so you can run your lures staggered. So what I'll do is I'll run my two corners side by side, I'll then run my two riggers side by side, I'll have a very long shotgun and then in the middle of that square that's created by my riggers and my corners, I'll run a second shotgun on a spreader bar, which is something we'll talk about in a little bit. Okay, now you know what speed to troll at and how to set your lures in your spread. The next question I got asked was, what are my favorite lures? I'm running a full spread of Bonds lures, and just like when I'm marlin fishing, I'm running a wide range of colors, sizes, and head shapes to try and maximize my chances of matching the bait fish that my target species is eating. Unlike when I'm marlin fishing, 
instead of running five lures, I'm running six for the tuna. I'm running my two corners, my two riggers, a short shotgun and a long shotgun. The lures you'll definitely find in my tuna spread are at least a couple of bullet head lures like this Bond's weapon. It's great in the long positions, the shotgun, all the riggers and the tuna absolutely love them. There's a few different models that Bond's makes. This is the weapon. There's also the Data, the Exocet, the DLB. They all seem to work really, really good on the tuners. Closer to the boat, I'll run a cup face lure like this Bond's D Shackle. That's absolutely deadly on the tuners. There's been a real performer this year. And on my other shorter lure, I'll run an angle face lure like that Bond's Undertaker. The other difference when I'm running my tuna spread is that I'm adding teasers to the actual lures as opposed to just running them as separate hookless teasers. And that leads me on to my next question. What's my preference between spreader bars and daisy chains? Now before I answer that question, I'll take a little bit of a step back and explain what daisy chains and spreader bars are. This here is a daisy chain. It's basically a string of rubber squid. When I'm marlin fishing, I'll run one of these on each side of the boat with a big soft head hookless lure as a teaser. I run them very close to the boat and they're awesome at popping up marlin. When I'm fishing for tuna, however, instead of atta attaching a hookless teaser lure, I'm attaching a tuna lure with a hook in it. So I run two of those. They're running closer to the boat, making the most amount of noise and those are on my shorts. On my longer lures, I'm running a bird. On both of my rigger lures, I run that on my longer lures and that skips along the surface, makes a nice amount of noise. And again, the tuna really love that. And on my short shotgun, I'm running a spreader bar. It's basically a one dimensional dredge or five small daisy chains all on a piece of wire and on the central daisy chain, I attach my jet head lure, such as the assassin. Jet head lure, which means there's holes in the end of the lure, the water runs through the lure, and it makes a nice little smoke trail out the back. So that's what I'm running in terms of the teasers on my lure. The reason I'm doing that is because it's creating the maximum amount of noise, the maximum amount of commotion, and those fish deep down in the water are seeing that as the spread goes over the top of them, they're coming into the spread, they're getting fired up, they're coming forward towards your lures and they're eating. The reason you can get away with running all these teasers when you're chasing tuna is that when a tuna eats a lure, it doesn't jump. If you had all this stuff with a marlin, it would come out of the water, do its window wiper, it's gonna create a hell of a mess, it's gonna have weight close to the lure, it's gonna maximize the chance of that marlin being able to spit the lure out whereas a tuna's gonna grab it and run, and it actually helps to create a bit of drag in the water, which I think subdues the fish a little bit. That's not why I run them. The reason I run them is because I think it helps raise tuna, and I think I get you get more bites. Now, back to the question. What's my preference between spreader bars and daisy chain lures versus lures all by themselves, such as that? My preference is to run the spreader bars, the daisy chains, the birds, and I'll tell you why. All the southern bluefin tuna I have caught have been on lures that are running the teasers with them. Having said that, I run almost all of my lures apart from the long shotgun with those teasers. So chances are, if I'm gonna catch tuna, it's gonna be on the lures with all the teasers attached. We were in Waihau Bay a couple of seasons ago. We had a pack attack. We hooked five tuna at once. We had six lures out. What was the only lure that didn't get bit? The one without the teasers on it. So I had such an impressive start to running those teasers on the lures that I'm a fan. I'm always going to run them. If you're not getting bit and you're running the teasers, it's something different. And it, it, you, there's a temptation to blame the teasers. That's personal preference for me. Again, this year, I caught a tuna on the Assassin behind the spreader bar, and the proof's in the pudding, right? So, to answer that question, I prefer the teasers. That doesn't mean you're gonna catch tuna. If you don't run the teasers, it's been proved many, 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 many times this season that the lures running by themselves 
will catch tuna just fine. It's up to you. They both work. If it's me, I'm going to use the teaser system. The next question while we're talking about teasers was strip teaser or daisy chain? We've talked about the daisy chain. I'm always going to run daisy chains. I also, however, am going to be running a strip teaser or what's commonly known as a dredge. It imitates a school of bait fish and it is very, very effective at raising pelagic fish, marlin, tuna. I'll never leave home without one. I run one religiously when I'm marlin fishing and it's the same when I'm tuna fishing. I run it off my bonds, carbon dredge boom, and it's attached to the boom with a dial electric reel. Makes pulling it in an absolute breeze. So to answer the question, I don't choose daisy chains or strip dredges. I choose them both and they both work really, really well. Okay, while we're talking about the spread, another question that came in was, what do I reckon about having a bibbed minnow deep diver lure and if so, single or double hook? I've already explained to you guys what my spread is, the lures I'm using and the teasers I'm using and you would have seen that there wasn't a hard bodied bib lure in that. For those of you guys that want to know what that kind of lure is, it's something like that. That's a Nomad DTX minnow, it's a hard bodied lure and it's got that bibbed front which helps it dive deep under the water. I don't currently run one of these, but there's been many, many tuna caught over the last few seasons on these lures. I personally haven't had any success on it, but it's been proven that these are a very effective lure. At catching tuna, they're good in the fact that they'll target a deeper part of the water column. So on those days where the fish are feeding a little bit deeper, adding a bib lure into your spread could be a good way and it could be the difference. If I was running one, I'd run it the same as that. I'd have two hooks on it. And the good thing about these lures, and the same with my normal skirted lures, is that the hooks are nice and close together. Tuna generally go for the head of a bait fish, and if they come at a lure like that with their big mouths, hopefully they'll get both those hooks in their mouth, and you'll have a way better chance of landing the fish. Okay, now that we've talked about the spread, the next question I got asked was more about the gear we're using. The question was, what is the minimum rod and reel combo you can use when you're targeting southern bluefin tuna? They want to know about drags and they want to know about spool capacity. Most guys are using their marlin gear for bluefin tuna fishing, whether that's a 130 wide, an 80 wide, a 50 wide, a 30 wide, whatever they're comfortable using and that's totally fine, they work really well. What I've been using, both for my marlin and now for my bluefin tuna fishing, is this Daiwa Saltiga Lever Drag 60. It's a 25 size reel, it's got 25 kilos of drag, it's nice and light, it's really fun to use, and on here I can fit 600 meters of 60 pound hollow, and about 60 or 70 meters of 37 kilo Varivis Mono Top Shot, and then on top of that, I've got a 250 pound wind on leader. I've found these setups to be extremely capable at catching marlin, now at catching tuna. They're really fun to use, and I've found that that 700 meters or so is more than enough line capacity to deal with all the fish I've caught so far. Having said that, most of the time you're targeting southern bluefin tuna, you're going to find yourself in deeps of a depths of a thousand meters or more. Whereas when I'm striped marlin fishing off the west coast, I'm anywhere from 50 meters to 100 meters there or thereabouts. So if your tuna, when you're using these smaller reels with a reduced line capacity, decides to do a run to the bottom in a thousand meters, you're not going to have enough line. You don't want to get into a tug of war with a bluefin tuna where you're trying to outmuscle it. Just like marlin, Drag control is the key during the fight, and less is sometimes best. And what I mean by that is sometimes subtle drag control, backing off on the drag, can change a fish's mind during the fight. It's not something I can teach you on a video, it's something that you'll learn with experience, but it's just worth keeping in mind that drag control, changing something during the fight. 
backing off the drag, changing your boat position, sometimes driving away from the fish, sometimes driving on top of the fish, sometimes cranking the drag all the way up and then backing it off, are little things you can do to change a fish's mind during the fight. You don't want to get into a tug of war with a 100 kilo bluefin tuna. Just like a lot of other species, the harder you pull, the harder they pull back. Sometimes when you back off, they'll back off. It's worth remembering that. Personally, I think these Lever Drag 60s are a fantastic reel. I've really enjoyed using them and I'd recommend them for your bluefin tuna setups. They're a lot of fun. One of you guys asked, about why Hell Bay being such a popular area to target the southern bluefin tuna. If you're based in Auckland, where is the nearest hunting ground that regularly produces southern bluefin tuna? And can you go west from the Manukau Bar? So that's kind of two questions. I guess the closest place for you guys to target bluefin tuna in terms of proximity to a boat ramp would be somewhere like out the back of Great Barrier Island. In terms of driving, I would probably suggest Later on in the run, when the fish are coming closer off the back of the Aldermans, off the Coromandel Peninsula, then that's probably a pretty good bet. The closest they get to the coast is Waiho Bay, hence why it's so popular. I guess it's up to you how much you want to spend towing your boat, how much you want to spend driving your boat. That's personal choice. The question about the Manukau, I've been told that commercial longliners catch them all the way from Fiordland up off Nelson, off New Plymouth, then up off Raglan and the Kuiper and onwards. So yes, the tuna are off the west coast, the Manukau. However, the problem there is how much further you've got to go to get them. The 1,000 metre line is at least 50, 50 nautical miles, probably further. There's a lot less boat traffic out there. There's not much information sharing. Go on, go give it a go. I'd love to know that off my beloved West Coast, recreational guys can go and catch Southern Bluefin Tuna. They will be there. The question is, can we find them? Next question was, when are the best bite times? The best bite times are when the tuna are biting. Stupid answer. What I've found is it seems to be early in the morning and late in the evening. In my limited experience, that seems to be the most productive time that's when the radio really lights up with people getting bites after that i would say in that hour and a half either side of the tide also tends to be a very productive time for bluefin bites and for marlin bites so first thing in the morning change of light all types of fishing that change of light is the most productive bite time it's exactly the same with the bigger species after that i would say that hour and a half either side of the slack tide and around bite times, the next question is, how does the moon phase affect the bites? Talking to the commercial guys, they really love that five day period leading up to the full moon and then the bite on the full moon. In a perfect world, that's when you're gonna go and target your bluefin tuna. This year, I got told by a couple of mates, don't bother going fishing. It's the wrong moon phase. There was a nice little weather window. A bunch of people went fishing and they all caught fish. What I think really is going to dictate as a recreational fisherman in New Zealand when you can go fishing for bluefin tuna is A, the weather, and B, how close they are to the coast. So I'd be way more concerned about picking your weather window. You're going to go a long way offshore. It's at a pretty inclement time of the year for weather. I'd be more worried about the weather forecast in the moon phase. If you can time it with a good weather window and a good moon phase, his chances of success are just gonna go up and up. Well, while we're talking about going offshore, I've had a question asking, what gear should I take for offshore fishing? There's a few things you wanna have on your boat, regardless of whether you're going inshore or offshore. Number one on that list is a life jacket for everybody on board. They need to be high quality, in good condition, and everybody on board needs to have one that fits them, and they need to know how to use them, particularly if they're inflatable ones. You also need preferably two forms of communication. You cannot rely on a cell phone when you're offshore. You need to have a good quality, high powered, working EHF radio. You need to know how to use it. You also wanna have fire extinguishers on board. There's nothing more dangerous on a boat at sea than a fire. I've got two fire extinguishers. Fingers crossed I never have to use them, but you wanna have those on your boat as well. You wanna have a way of being seen. A flare kit, very, very important. You also want to have an EPIRB, an emergency locator beacon. 
These days you can have very high quality GPS enabled EPIRBs that will send a precise location to rescuers when you activate them. It can really make a difference when there's a search in the big wide ocean. There's a bunch of other stuff you can add to your boat. Some spares, a basic toolkit, lots of food and drink, sunscreen, manual bilge pumps, but communication, fire extinguishers, life jackets, flares and a VHF radio are the real important ones. You've got to have them if you're going on an offshore fishing adventure. Okay, so the next question I got was around using your sounder to find fish. The question was, are you looking for the tuna on the sounder? And if so, what settings are best? Well, I jumped on my boat and I filmed a wee video showing you what settings I used. But just to give a recap, what I'm doing is I'm setting up my screen in a custom combo with all the information I want to see when I'm game fishing. I'll have my sonar, which will be split into a range of 150 meters and then the top 50 meters. I'll have my chart and then I'll have a graph showing the water temperature. When I'm setting up my sonar, I am looking for tuna. The best settings I've found for doing that are setting my range to 150 meters. So I go into my sonar settings, I go to the range function and I set my range at 150 meters. When you're in really deep water and your sonar is trying to find the bottom the whole time, it sacrifices the image you get in that area, particularly if you're in very deep water. So what, if you set the range as opposed to the zoom to 150 meters, your sonar is concentrating only in that top 150 meters of the water column, which is where the pelagic fish you're targeting are gonna be. Then I set my screen up, once I've set the range to a split zoom, and I'll, on the second screen, I'll zoom in to the top 50 meters, so then I can see the fish that really we're targeting. It's nice to have that other 150 meter range so you can see if there's any big bait schools, I don't want to miss anything there. But in reality, what I'm really interested in is that top 50 meters. What I'll then do is I'll go to my echo stretch function and I'll increase the echo stretch. That will stretch out the returns I'm getting on my sonar. It'll, it'll make an individual fish stand out more, particularly if they're fast moving fish like tuna. And then the final thing I'll do is I'll manually adjust the gain up as high as I can till there's enough, just enough clutter that I can see I'm not going to miss anything. You'll see if you crank your gain manually all the way up, your screen will get a lot of clutter in it. It'll be just about unreadable. What I'll do is I'll push it all the way up till there's enough clutter that I'm happy to deal with, but I can clearly see bait and the fish that I'm targeting. So the answer to your question is, yes, I am looking for tuna on my sounder. It's a very important tool for all my game fishing and hopefully those settings will help you set your sonar and sounder up as well. Okay, so you're lucky enough to have caught a bluefin tuna. The next question I got asked was, how do you deal with the fish once you've caught them? Tuna are a very warm bodied fish. They've got really, really hot blood in them, a lot of blood in them, and when you stick your hand inside their gut cavity, you won't believe how warm they are. It's really crucial once you catch that fish to get all the blood out of it, to get the gills and the guts out of it as quick as you can, and to pack it on ice. What you'll find when you gaff that fish, particularly if you gaff it around the head or gill area, which is a really good idea because you don't damage any of the flesh, it'll bleed a lot of its blood out right there in the water. Once you've got it on board, put a small nick upwards along its lateral line, get any excess blood out of there, get your wash down hose, flush it out, then open up, its gill area, you'll see a membrane there attaching its gills to its body. Cut along that, remove those gills, tear them out, leave them attached to the guts though, and then make a circle around the bum hole of the fish and you'll be able to pull the guts and the gills out in one complete package. You'll be surprised that there's not really a lot of guts that come out of those big fish and you'll notice when you put your hands inside that fish how warm it is. Flush it out, get as much of the blood and gut material out of the cavity, out of the head as you can. Pack it full of ice. You wanna have a whole bunch of ice on board when you're targeting these fish. You wanna maximize their eating qualities. Pack that fish full of ice, get it in a fish bag, and let the meat set. If you're gonna weigh the fish, still get the blood and the guts and the gills out of it. You're not gonna lose a lot of weight. Who cares how much it weighs? It's not worth sacrificing 
the eating quality of a fish just so you can get a glory shot at the gantry you can still get that shot but you can also get the benefits of a prime prime table fish if you're not going to weigh that fish you can even go that step further quarter the fish at sea put the quarters on ice get rid of the rest of the waste and you'll be left with beautiful eating fish it's absolutely phenomenal and while we're talking about the eating qualities of the fish I got asked what my favorite recipe for eating southern bluefin tuna is. For me, there's no better meal than raw bluefin tuna sashimi. If I want to zhuzh it up a little bit, I'll cut it into lovely slices, drizzle some sesame oil over it, crush up some wasabi peas, sprinkle that over it, sprinkle some dried shallots, and then I'll put a nice line of kewpie, Japanese mayo across it, dip that in wasabi and soy sauce. It's absolutely delicious, or just straight fresh bluefin tuna dipped with a bit of wasabi, a bit of soy sauce. It's absolutely to die for. This year I also did a lovely tataki. I rolled the tuna loins in peanut oil. I then coated them in black and white sesame seeds. I seared the fish briefly on each side, made up a nice tataki sauce, drizzled that over the top of it. Absolutely divine. There's so many beautiful ways to eat it. I'm sure you'll find something delicious when you catch one of your own. Another question I got asked was, what note do you offer the fish gods on a slow day? I assume that means what sort of dollar bill denomination do you put under your line? You might have seen that on slow guys. Slow days, some superstitious guys will run out a bit of line and they'll try and buy a bite. They'll put a $5, $10, $20, $50, $100 note under their line. If that lure gets bit, the line comes out. You sacrifice your note to the god. I don't subscribe to too many fishing superstitions. I like country music. Eating a feed is a good way to get a bite. But the best way you can maximize your chances of catching bluefin tuna is to be in a spot where bluefin tuna are. Talk to people. Study your sea surface temperatures. Get online. See where people are catching them. Look where the other boats are fishing. Be respectful of that but use all the information you can gather to go out and find them for yourselves. Look for the bait. Look for subtle temperature breaks. Look for current lines on the water. Something different. Use all your senses to try and find those fish. I reckon that'll work way better for you than sticking a $20 bill under your line. And the last question was, what's the best beer to raise them? I don't know. Everyone's got their favorite. But what I will say is, don't drink beers and get on the VHF radio. Anyone that was out bluefin fishing this year knows what I'm talking about. So do it in moderation. All right, team, that's all the questions that I got through. There was a few variations of similar ones there. Hopefully those of you, if I didn't answer your exact question out of all the information I tried to share in this video, you got a little something to take away. What I will say is the southern bluefin tuna fishery is a magnificent fishery. We're very, very lucky to have it in New Zealand. It needs to be respected, it needs to be looked after, but most of all, it needs to be enjoyed. Take heaps of ice, respect your catch, be courteous out there, and have heaps of fun, team. Good luck. Yo.